so you mentioned you're from brazil and uh, yeah populism over there populism in the uk populism in the us why do you think populism and fascism and nationalism these sort of quite ugly leanings of usually right-wing governments i think uh why do you think this style of politics has become popular again now like over the last five years um i think they've always been popular I don't think there has ever been a point where they weren't. I mean, I think in perhaps immediately the post-war, immediately the period immediately after the Second World War, perhaps, yay, you know, like people really were confronted with fascism to a scale that they hadn't been confronted before. So they voted more progressive governments in power. I mean, it's not a coincidence that it was after the Second World War that we have the NHS mm. and that we have uh, the, um, the welfare system that we now have. It was created directly as a result of a uh, progressive labor government being voted into power straight mm. after the Second World War. But it didn't stay in power for long. Mm. And you have um, you have um, regressive politics taking place all the time. And in Brazil, for example, Brazil was under a military dictatorship from the 60s until I believe 1985 or 1981. And that's not that long ago. And yeah. Jair Bolsonaro, the president, was elected in 2000 and god i forget 19 i believe um and he spoke openly about how much he admired the military dictatorship how the the military dictatorship didn't kill enough people he would have killed more you know and he was still elected yeah so there is an even shorter space of time there than you have now than you have here with the uk and the second world war the reason for it i think there is many there's many that can um lots of academics like myself and others spend a lot of time and effort trying to understand it and explain it. But for me, it all goes back to nationalism. Mm. And nationalism at its basis is the political doctrine that requires that the state and the nation be congruent. So what that means in normal language is that nationalism means that you have to have the nation and the state be the same, that um, government by foreign rule is a violation. And it is the political doctrine that really explains the world that we live in now. You know, the system of nation states that we have was created in the Treaty of Westphalia, responding to the needs of, of nationalism. So all of this is, is relatively new from the 1900s onwards. But what I mean by that is that um, this idea that the nation and the state, the people and the state have to be the same, mm. was never true, was never a reality, because the world has never been homogenous. But it was easier to maintain an illusion of homogeneity yeah. back when people had fewer rights and back when we didn't have the, the information revolution that we have now with the Internet. The more we move to improving human rights and an understanding of human rights, which we have made huge strides towards, and the more we are embedded in a communication revolution where we're able to communicate and get news from everywhere in the world, the more and more this illusion of one people, one state gets shattered, you know, the illusion of borders. Mm. Borders are, are artificial. They, they're kept in place by a piece of paper, you know, your passport, and they are artificial, they are an illusion, but they are kept in place by all this apparatus. and the unreality and artificiality of this apparatus becomes more and more evident every day. So what I see, the way I see it, all of this is like the death throes of nationalism as a way of ordering the world. It didn't work back in the day. That's why we had lots of wars and lots of people didn't have rights. It doesn't work now, even less than it ever did, the illusion that there is a state mm. for one people, you know, the illusion of homogeneity. And what we're seeing now is, is it's death throes and this really fruitless, fight to hold this idea in place which no longer works but which people are dying and committing violence and um, and the state is committing violence to maintain in place which i find really depressing but at times i also find it quite um encouraging and hopeful because the system of nation states was created by individuals it's not a natural law you know like gravity or things yeah, like yeah. that it was it's a res result of human action so it can be changed because of human action as well we built it we can unbuild it and make something better out of it do you do, are you quite sort of hopeful then that we'll end up in a in a utopian situation where there actually aren't borders and uh or, or even countries like is that the sort of end goal you'd like to get to or people always ask me that and they always look at me like i'm crazy and i'm like yeah no open borders because it reflects the reality of humanity 
humanity, humans have always moved. Yeah. We have never been stationary. We have always moved and we're always going to continue to move. And trying to deny this natural impulse of movement is causing people so much damage. I think that the end game will be something like open borders, but I don't, does that mean that it will be the end of the nation state? Is it possible to maintain the nation state while keeping open borders? We see this experiment with the European Union in the Schengen area where you do have open borders there mm -hmm. and there are successes and failures when it comes to that. I don't know, but I don't know when it comes to me being hopeful or not. I mean, it depends on the day. Most time, no, I think we are all going down <laughs> the abyss. But um, I try not to be so, optim so, so optimistic, so pessimistic <laughs> because of the fact that this is all happening because of human action and human action can change it as well. And I see a lot of things that make me hopeful. But like I said, it is dependent on human action. And if yeah. we don't act, it won't happen.